Welcome everyone to the La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast. I'm your hostess, Monique Ramsey. Today, I am welcoming Dr. Diana Breister back to the podcast. She's our plastic surgeon who loves all things mommy makeover. And today we're going to talk about breast lift specifically. So welcome, Dr. Breister. Hi, good morning. Nice to good see morning. you again. Yeah, good to see you. So I think the first question a lot of women might have when they're thinking about breast lift surgery is, you know, what what's it going to do for me? And so maybe you could talk about, you know, some of the questions that you hear most often from patients. Yeah. So, you know, as women, our breasts continue to change throughout our life. That's just the reality. And with um, having a child, especially, that really accelerates the changes that happen in the breast. Um, the breasts get very large. Many women breastfeed. And then after that process is over, the breasts, you know, involute usually, which means you kind of lose breast tissue. So that can really result in a lot of saggy tissue, drooping, um, and that sort of thing. And that seems like the biggest um, sadness for women after they have a kid and they are like, oh, wow, my breasts have gone or where, where are they? The other thing is that the breasts get really large uh, when they're breastfeeding and they actually like that. So um, so when women come in, usually postpartum or or maybe not even postpartum, just, you know, at some point in their life that um, their breasts have started to droop, they want to know what can I do uh, to restore volume, make these less droopy. Um, so that's really the main um you know, complaint or concern that I get is that the breasts have changed over time. Most women want them back to what they were or want them back to what they were and then some. So it's really a lot of times just restoring to to what they had. And what's the usual age? Is this something that you see across a broad spectrum of ages or is it typically done at a certain time? So I do see this across a very broad spectrum. Um, you know, postpartum can, you know, these days be anywhere from 25 to 45. So all ages um, I see, and and sometimes even older women as, as they age, you know, head, heading into menopause, they can experience some of these changes too. So I would say the most popular age group is going to be between about 35 and 40, uh, but it really encompasses all age groups. So is the most common complaint that they have lost the volume or is it a shape related question? Or, or, or the, the fact that they're pointing, they're pointing downwards at their toes. <laughs> I would say it's a combination of all of them. And as women, everybody's breasts are completely different. Um, sometimes, yes, the nipple can start pointing downward in some women. Um, some women just get that la- uh, loss of shape, you know, that they, they don't like that can, that can be a problem or um, loose skin is another big problem. So it really encompasses all those problems. Now, I think one of the questions I've heard people talk about with, among my friend group is, well, if I have a lift and they, they see where those scars are, it's kind of the same scarring that or scar placement is that you would have with a reduction. So is a breast lift gonna make their breasts smaller? Well, you know, theoretically, there is, um, we remove skin when we do a breast lift. So the volume that that skin theoretically takes up is definitely, you know, technically slightly smaller. But since we are transpositioning the breast tissue up into a higher place, um, I don't think a woman should really appreciate that they're smaller. What they what they will know is that they are higher and they are fuller and they are perkier. So the smallness um, factor, although it is absolutely theoretical, and you know, you know, yes, you're using you're losing some volume, but really this it's it's no breast tissue, it's only skin. So the amount that you might lose or be smaller is very minute. Oh, good. That's good to know. And yeah. do you do breast lifts without an implant? Sometimes I know a lot of women, you know, 
use that opportunity to get that fullness back by adding an implant. But what if a person doesn't want an implant? So that ha- that really relies, uh, that decision relies on how much breast tissue a woman has. And it just, and, you know, what are their goals? And some women are very, um, you know, steadfast against not wanting an implant and just wanting their own tissue. And even though they may have not a whole lot of tissue, that's enough tissue for them. And they are happy getting that uh, replaced in, you know, lifted and replaced. So I would say that you can absolutely positively do a lift without an implant. And you just realize that I'm not going to be adding any volume. I'm going to take the volume that I have existing and put it into a tighter skin envelope and lift it up on my chest. So it's absolutely something I do quite a bit. And if the person, so you were saying a minute ago, if the person doesn't want an implant and if they're starting with enough tissue, can you kind Mm -hmm. of shift it? You're shifting it up. Exactly. Exactly. It's basically how much tissue is enough for that individual or how much volume. And so, you know, we have a discussion about that and I really try to get to know what the woman's thinking, what her vision is for her body. Is she thinking she wants more fullness in that center cleavage area? And really, you know, we we can kind of manipulate the tissue and see how it's going to look. And if if that is, you know, if they really are searching for more volume, especially in the medial area, then sometimes, um, you know, a, an, an implant's going to be necessary to achieve that. And the medial area would be in, in the middle? Or right down or, the center where where you would say cleavage is, oh, you know, that's okay. really like where the decollete is. If you're wearing a low cut shirt and you can see, you know, uh, a shadowing of the breasts, that is really what we call medial pole fullness. And that is definitely improved with a lift only. However, some women want a more full than what the tissue they have. And in that situation, um, a breast implant might be um, necessary at the same time as the lift. And is, because we were talking recently about fat grafting Mm -hmm. and let's say they want some extra shape. Do you do fat grafting at all with breast lifts? I do, yes. And that is... um, something that some women will uh, request, especially if they don't want an implant. And we can, you know, suction fat from somewhere else in the body, and then we can inject that into, um, in and around the breast tissue to create more volume. The biggest drawback of fat transfer is that it is somewhat unpredictable in that there is an amount of fat that does go away. We just can never be sure just how much of that's going to go away. And then the other limitation is that it's a limitation in how much volume you can achieve with that. Mm. There's definitely um, a a fluffing up or a perking up, but it's never going to be quite as much as an implant is going to give. And it's not going to be as predictable as an income, as an implant. So you just have to kind of weigh the options and uh, make sure the patient knows that the fat grafting is absolutely possible. However, there's some limitations to that. And of the fat, let's say you're putting fat in the breast just to round it out or, mm-hmm. you know, do make that shape that the patient's looking for. Is that permanent? Well, like I said, some of the fat goes away and then some of it stays. They say maybe anywhere from 30 to 50% of that fat stays. The fat actually obtains a blood supply from the surrounding tissue and should be permanent forever and stay in that area. Uh, in that area, it basically is another fat cell in the area. So yeah, the, the amount of fat that does stay should be permanent. Should be permanent. Mm-hmm. So is there any difference in your surgical approach for a woman who is choosing to have an implant and the one who isn't? Like, does it change the scarring? Does it change? I don't know. How so you're doing it, the surgery? It really just depends on... Um, uh, on the patient. So if if we are performing a breast lift 
in conjunction with a um, implant. We, we can put that implant in through those incisions we're making for the lift. So it doesn't create any new scars whatsoever. It's just, it's a, it goes in through those incisions that we're making to create the lift. So no, it doesn't create any new scars. Um, we can make that pocket. We usually put it under the muscle and we can do that within um, the areas that we've uh, already opened up in the breast. Okay. And so those in sh- excuse me those incisions can you kind of walk everybody through where yeah. those would be so in order to actually reconstruct or um you know change the breast tissue and have any meaningful change we have to uh, remove skin. Okay. And that, and there's a very, uh, basic kind of formula that we have to use. And usually this is going to go all the way around the areola. So a circular kind of incision around the areola. And then there's always going to be a vertical component. So a line straight down from the edge of the areola down to what we call the inframammary fold. So in the very least, a woman will have what we call a lollipop incision. So it's a circle attached to a straight line. And that's going to be most mostly the minimum uh, amount of incisions. There are some physicians that may do just a circle around the areola. And in very, um, very select instances, this may be, um, you know, something that can be done. However, I find that that circular incision tends to widen or stretch out. So it's not a usual preference of mine to do a circum areola, as they call it, just around the areola. And uh, moreover, it really doesn't lift the breast as not as as much as, as kind of needs to be. So the very minimum there's going to be a lollipop incision with a circle around the areola straight line down. And then in women that need more skin, there will even be a underneath the breast incision. So um right where that fold is, there could be a, a horizontal line under that as well. And that line is usually hidden uh, by kind of the fold of the breast. So usually that one's not very visible. And then the other incisions are going to fade with time. Um, Healing is always very variable from patient to patient, but we have a lot of ways to help the patient to um, tend to those incisions and really maximize um, the healing and get them to, you know, fade away as quickly as possible. And what are some of the things that might make the scar harder to heal or easier to heal? Like- so the number one uh, issue with scarring is tension. So if there's too much tension on a on an incision, that can lead for a bad scar. So number one, we want to we want to walk that line of you know tightening things up, but they can't be too tight either. Now that being said, uh, it's very important in the post operative period for a patient to really lay low. If they start doing too much too soon, it can create swelling within the breast and that puts more tension on the incision. That can result in poor healing and poor scarring. So um, I would say those are the biggest factors that can influence um, healing is if if there's you know too much tension from swelling or what that can lead to a poor scar. Um, so it's very important for a patient to relax and not do too much after their surgery. Um, that being said, also, you know, different patients, we all heal a little bit differently. So one person's going to heal faster than another. Um, and some of those things can't be controlled. Uh, but there are some scar silicone sheets and creams that we can recommend. And some women also even do laser that can help a scar to heal faster. So there really are some methods that can really uh, be effective. Yeah, I saw um, in our, our gallery, our web gallery, and I think we put it on social media a while back last year, there was a, a patient who had come in to have her scars lasered from her lift. Mm-hmm. And, and wow, <laughs> I had yeah. no idea that, you know, that, so that if you don't heal quite right. And like you say, yeah. everybody heals differently and makes different scars that yeah. there is something sometimes that can, can help that. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of women don't realize that 
asymmetric breast, you know, one breast being bigger than the other is kind of a normal thing. Is that something that you can correct with a breast lift? So, you know, absolutely it can be addressed. Absolutely. Um, that is very true. Most women's breasts are not absolutely identical. One might be a little bigger, a little wider, a little longer, a little less volume. So um, with the lift, we do have the liberty to take a little more skin out of one side versus another. Um, that being, and the other thing we can do is add an implant that might be a little bigger on one side, you know, to help compensate for differences. Um, but you always have to remember, even though we will we will do everything in our power to try to get them as, as symmetrical as possible. The body's imprint of that breast on the chest usually is always going to be a little bit different. So even though um, we can definitely compensate and, and do a very good job to correct that asymmetry, there may always still be a little bit of uh, asymmetry to those breasts. And the other thing I noticed, I saw a really great before and after of yours the other day. And I was like, oh, you know, the, the patient's areola, they were both really kind of large. And with that lift, not only was the breast more lifted and pretty, but the areola was smaller. Is that a common request? Um, very much so. Yeah. The areolas um, can be large and especially after childbirth, they can, you know, stretch out. And most most women will say, hey, can can we make the areola smaller? And that's absolutely something that we always, we, we can do very, very easily. Now, when we're thinking about the day of surgery, how long is this surgery and how long, you know, is the patient under anesthesia typically? So depending on if they have an implant or not, I would say the average amount of time for this procedure is going to be about two and a half hours of um, surgery time. So it's fairly quick, um, which is good. It's not a whole lot of time under anesthesia. Um, and then after the surgery, when they wake up from that surgery, they're going to have on a very nice snug compression bra. And as we spoke earlier, this compression bra helps to reduce swelling. So there is one thing after breast lifts, there's quite a bit of swelling within the tissue because we're doing a lot of uh, manip manipulating and maneuvering of the tissue. So, so swelling is something that, you know, we, we know is going to happen. So by putting on a nice compression bra, that can really help reduce the swelling and then having the patient uh, be very calm and laying low for, you know, five or six days after surgery can really really um, help. And that's really the most important time for the patient to be really laying low is right in the beginning. Now, I'm going to ask something that I don't know if, if this is just straight from my own experience, my own body. So if, you know, as we get older, <laughs> things mm -hmm. are looser, the skin is looser. What about the side of the breast where it's kind of, yeah. sometimes you end up with like pooches under your arms. Is that something that you can move and tighten up during well, that? Well, you know, we can absolutely address that uh, side area. Um, a lot of women tend to um, collect a little bit of fat over there. Um, a lot of women think that that's actually breast tissue over on the side. It's usually not breast tissue. It's usually just some subcutaneous fat. Um, so although, um, you know, it's not breast tissue, it can be liposuctioned during the procedure. Sometimes we either, we also take out a little bit extra skin, uh, in that area if there's actually a skin roll. So the answer is absolutely that lateral fluffy tissue can be absolutely addressed. Now, some of that though is the width of the breast. A woman may have quite a, a wide breast and that footprint or width of the breast can't really be changed. Changed. But we can do a lot to help uh, tighten that up and make the uh, effects of that a lot, a lot reduced because we can lower the volume and tighten up the skin and help to pull that tissue in in a certain way so it can absolutely be improved and addressed. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's the thing that you don't really have when you're in your 30s or 40s. It's like now I'm in my 50s. I'm like, wait, where's... Yeah, it kind of comes out of nowhere, from, that, that yeah. middle, the middle stuff, Yay. stuff in the middle. <laughs> Yay. So I'm assuming like most of the surgeries that we do at La Jolla Cosmetic, they can go home the same day. And Absolutely. You know, yep. It's outpatient. And then when do they see you for the first time again? Um, 
and usually between one to two days after the procedure, they we have them come in. We open the bra. We check. We make sure everything's looking good. Um, we At that point, we usually just close the bra back up. And women are probably going to need to not shower for about three to four days, keep the area dry. Um, and then they'll probably come back about five or six days after that. And at that point, we take off some of the stereo strips that are on the incisions, replace them, and just, you know, make sure everything is healing up great. Is this something that, because there's a lot of incisions and maybe an implant or not, do people have a lot of pain with this procedure or not really? Um, well, I think the lift in and of itself is not uh, extremely painful because that that part, we're not uh, you know, doing anything under the muscle. So the lift in and of itself is not painful. The implant can cause some discomfort because we usually place that under a muscle. So I would expect, you know, a moderate amount of pain with an implant and without an implant, it's, it's very tolerable. Most, most of the time a patient just kind of sits still, they're not going to be experiencing a lot of pain. So they can usually get by with just one or two days of uh, a pain pill. And then they're usually weaned off to something like Tylenol or Motrin after that time. Now, do the patients have a drain placed? I know with tummy tucks, a lot of times there's a drain. Is so drain usually for- I do not use drains in lifts or augmentations. So unless I'm doing an extensive amount of um, liposuction or if that woman is getting an implant replaced, uh, meaning an old one is removed, a new one is put in, uh, a lot of times if that replacement is happening, I will do some work in the pocket and that's called a capsulectomy. In that case, I do use a drain. But for the woman who is walking in and doesn't um, has doesn't have a breast implant already, if they're getting a mastopexy augmentation, which is that lift plus a breast implant, then they will not have a drain. And usually for the woman just getting a breast lift, they will not have a drain either. Now, what do your patients say when they, you know, feel the difference? Like, is it immediate uh, on that day two or does it take a little bit of time? (laughs) Well, I think that, you know, the first few days after surgery, they're just kind of trying to get through it. It seems to be a little, you know, it's a whirlwind. They don't really know what things look like, but, you know, by two or three days once that bra comes off and they, they lay, look down they're they're pretty excited to see, you know, the transformation of what, you know, what they have and very excited to kind of get their, uh, get their groove back, if you will. Yeah. Well, and so because there's a fair amount of scarring, depending on the patient, Mm -hmm. you know, when do the kind of give, walk us through sort of scar recovery, like what does that look like? When does it kind of start to get less red maybe? So, you know, the first um, four weeks of after surgery, those incisions are going to be covered up with a very special flesh-colored tape called a Steri-Strip. And that Steri-Strip is very instrumental in supporting that incision. As we spoke about, the tension on a wound is extremely important. So this Steri-Strip really takes off that ten- takes alleviate some of that tension. So for the first four weeks, the woman's not even going to see the, see the incision because it's going to be covered up with tape. Now, after that four-week period, we then uh, peel off those tapes. Any small little stitches are removed. At that point, the scar really looks like the finest line ever. It looks amazing, you know, initially. And it only is after some time that that incision starts to turn a little bit red and pink. Um, And that can last up to, you know, one to three or four months, depending on the patient. There's usually a pink a pink hue, um, you know, around the root, around the incision. And that, like I said, can take any amount of time. Now, some, some incisions can get more thick than others, but during this time after that four week is when we are really, um, advocating a silicone tape strip to lay down on that incision. And that silicone has been shown to really help take away the redness and, um, help to keep the scar flat. So I would say after, Two or three months, um, things should be pretty well calmed down. Um, still healing is taking place, but I think, you know, the majority should be starting to fade and getting flat. 
So talking about the tension on scars makes me mm-hmm. think, okay, <laughs> that means, you know, if, if swelling, they're not going to lift weights right away or going out for a run or when do you sort of advise your patients that they can get back into some sort of exercise? Yeah. So I would say probably about the three, the three week mark, if everything's looking pretty good, um, I will allow my patients to start doing some gentle walking, um, nothing bouncing, just get out, get fresh air, get a little bit of cardio just so you don't go crazy, you know, sitting in your house. So, you know, light, light cardio is usually okay at about three weeks. And then by anywhere from four to six weeks, um, women can usually start going back to their normal um, jogging or Pilates or um, even weightlifting at that time. By six weeks, the wound should be stable and very secure at that point. So um, usually it's okay to, to resume, you know, full activity by six weeks. Now, because we're such a sun and water loving community here in San Diego. Do you have, like, say your your patient is a snorkeler and they love to go snorkeling in the ocean. Do you have any rules around when they could go in a pool or when they could go in the ocean? Yeah. So, you know, once an incision theoretically is completely sealed up, um, it should be safe for them to go in. Now, technically that should happen about 48 hours, but I would not advocate anyone getting it wet before that time. So I would say at, you know, two to three weeks, if a patient is, you know, has a vacation that they're just dying to go on and they want to dip into the ocean, um, it should be fine if the incisions, like I said, are healed. Now, usually though, dipping into the ocean goes along with a lot of other active activity. <laughs> so, you know, a dip into the ocean is one thing, but like paddle boarding and surfing or, you know, that, that would be a no-no. But the incision, you know, if they have a pool in their backyard and they're just so hot and they just want to get in and dip in, absolutely fine. But the more vigorous water activities, like I said, should really be on hold till about four to six weeks. And is there any seasonality to the surgery at all? Does there need to be? Um, It just depends on the woman. There's really no seasonality. I I find with most plastic surgery um, that women are getting, you know, most women have very busy lives. They might have kids, they have a career. And so it's really when can they uh, put all the ducks in a row to have the support to do this when their husband's going to be around or when, you know, their mom can come into town or when they have work off or time off or they have an extra week here. So I find that most of the time it doesn't really go along with seasons, it, but it does go along with Um, when they can get time off. And, you know, I guess that would be sometimes in the summer, people have a little more time off. Sometimes around the holidays, uh, people have time off. So those are very popular times for uh, procedures because they they do have some time and usually some family backup to help at that point. And if, you know, this is sort of a, not everybody would be getting a breast lift because they're a mom, but but a lot of breast lifts are because you've had pregnancies and breastfeeding. What do you advise in terms of lifting your kids if you have a two-year-old or a 18-month-old or... Yeah, you know, depending on the weight of the child, obviously, um, you know, I would say you need to wait about three weeks or so. And then even at that time, um, you know, if you can avoid doing it repeatedly all day long, that would be helpful. But yeah, you do need to give yourself a little bit of time that you're not doing those strenuous things because as we talked about, the wounds don't have their tensile strength at that point and, you know, sudden movements or, you know, strenuous things can can have an incision pop open, but you're kind of balancing that, you know, kids want to be with their mommies. They want to hug them. They want to, you know, so a lot of times I'll say, just, you know, sit down, have someone put the baby on your lap or the, you know, toddler on your lap and you can get the cuddles in, but, but the repetitive into car seats and into uh, high chairs and into cribs, you know, that, that really should at least be on hold for about three weeks. Okay. And if, the patient is, you know, a, a newer, like let's say they're, they've had two children, they're not going to have any more children and they've been breastfeeding. How long do you want them to be post 
breastfeeding before you operate on them? Yeah. So I think that there should be at least about four to six months of not breastfeeding before they undergo breast surgery. You know, the milk ducts kind of stay active and open for a little while. We want those things all to be shut down because there can be complications um, if a woman is still lactating. That can be a big problem. Um, Infection or even something called a milk fistula where, you know, milk can start coming out of a drain if if necessary. So, the, you know, the recommended time is probably at least about four to six months of not having breastfed. The other thing that I will advise to women is it's, it's going to be best if you can get as close to your desired weight. Um, because as we all know, you know, weight fluctuating can cause fluctuations in the breast as well. And if you have the surgery and then you go on and lose 20 pounds, your breasts may shrink, they may droop a little more, and you may wish that you had a bigger implant. So definitely uh, done with breastfeeding for about four to six months and as close as you can to your pre your desired weight. And that's really good advice. Yeah. The price range for moms, so we, just for everybody in the audience, we do have our prices and, and they're in ranges because of course there's different variations depending on what kind of lift and with an implant, without an implant, what kind of implants. But it looks like the range starts without an implant around 10,500. And then with an implant, it's more like 14,500 and and up. And so when they come in for the consultation with you, you're going to be going through, you know, you're examining them, but you're going to be going through, you know, if, if they want to lift with an implant, probably what are their choices and you all select implants and, and do you have kind of a way for them to visualize what that might look like on them? So we do have um, a fitting um, that we can do with a woman. We have these shaped implants that can go into a bra and it, it helps a lot to help visualize what that added volume is going to add to their body. So we usually have them put on a kind of a form fitting t-shirt and a special bra. And then we can, you know, we can experiment. Is it 200 of cc's of volume or is it 400 they need or what they like? And they, so, so there is a method that I like to use that is pretty accurate in helping to nail down the how how just how big they want to become. So we do that with implant sizers. Okay. So if a patient is not living in San Diego, you know, we get a lot of people who hmm? come to San Diego sort of for a rejuvenation vacation and um, will have surgery here, but can they do, you know, can you do a consultation, let's say, uh, virtually? from, from yeah. wherever they might live mm -hmm. and what would that look like if they were going to then come to Yeah, so we can do, them. you know, a Zoom consult and we can really get them all the information and see if they're a good candidate. We have, you know, HIPAA encrypted, you know, email where they can send some pictures that um, are totally secure, but we can, we can evaluate what, you know, what they need and they could come into town, they could have their pre-op, you know, a day or two before the surgery. Um, undergo the surgery and then stay in town. I would say 10 at the very least, but 10 to 14 days is probably going to be recommended uh, before you get on a plane and travel. And that's because we just want to make sure that all those wounds are very secure and everything is on its way to healing um, by the time you go back to wherever you are. So we don't want you to have a problem you know, somewhere and then we can't really help you. So I'd say about 10 to 14 days of staying in town uh, for that surgery is going to be uh, recommended. And one of the last questions I was thinking of, and it's not very common here in San Diego, but there are people who smoke. Mm -hmm. And I know smoking can, you know, be a, a complicating factor. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So can you kind of go through some of the, you know, what smoking does to yeah. patients or to healing and maybe some other things that are also risky behaviors? Yeah. So, um, you know, vascularity, which is uh, the blood supply to a tissue is of utter, you know, extreme importance here because 
we're literally taking apart, you know, the breast, putting it back together. And especially in a lift, we are lifting skin flaps and kind of removing them from their blood supply. So smoking is the number one, um, you know, terrible factor for wound healing. It just is a disaster, honestly. Um, that smoking causes, you know, a vasoconstriction of the vessels. That means the vessels get tinier. So therefore you're delivering less blood to those, uh, those areas that desperately need it for healing. So smoking is an absolute no go. If a woman wants a mastopexy, um, that and basically a facelift are, are, um, basically non-negotiable. Um, that those procedures should not be done in smokers. And that being said, I think they should be, um, not smoking for probably around two months before the procedure to really, um, you know, maximize their chances of healing well. Even then, um, their their vascularity can kind of be permanently um, distorted in a way. So even if they've stopped smoking, you I would warn them that there still could be some wound healing complications. So um, that in and of itself is is one of the worst. Too much activity too soon is going to be terrible for wound healing. And um, diabetes can also be a problem, especially an uncontrolled diabetic. Um, we know that there's a lot of microvascular changes in diabetics. So that is something that if someone is a diabetic, we need to make sure at least that they are very well controlled. Um, but there are methods, you know, if someone does have some wound healing problems, we have now hyperbaric oxygen therapy that can really help to deliver more oxygen to the wounds and help them. Um, but you know, the first, the first and foremost, it's better just to not be smoking <laughs> before the surgery. Right, right. And we don't want to get to that point where you need hyperbaric oxygen. <laughs> I, exactly. And is there so really smoking and maybe uncontrolled diabetes? Any any other? things that you um, try to advise patients about? Um, I, you know, obviously, um, you know, vitamin E, fish oil, um, red wine, these are all things that can make your blood a little bit thinner. So we try to have them ab abstain from those things for about 10 days beforehand. Also, there's a lot of different supplements and herbs and things out there now. And I, generally tell the patients to stop taking all that stuff just because we just don't know what's in it. Um, and we don't want anything else to complicate that, that wound healing. So basically off all supplements that uh, aren't really necessary and especially the vitamin E, fish oil, red wine, aspirin, you know, Celebrex, Motrin, we have lists of things that can all uh, cause bleeding problems. So the nurses are really good about going through all that with the patient before the procedure. Yeah. And that pre-op visit, I think is like just golden because you really do go over everything and you get your little booklet, mm -hmm. you know, what to do, what not to do prior to surgery, you know, it's very comprehensive. Yeah. Immediate post-op and then sort of getting back into life. So, mm -hmm. um, so Dr. Breister, is there anything that we didn't cover that you want to make sure the audience knows about breast, breast lift surgery? Well, I think that, you know, I think if a woman is thinking about it or just kind of looking down, I, you know, I think that they should really um, owe it to themselves to at least consider it, put themselves, you know, up there with priorities because, um, you know, our bodies are our temple. You know, we, we need to feel good in our bodies and it can be so you know, defeating for a woman to, you know, have these beautiful kids and then just feel like, you know, they just don't feel very pretty anymore. So I really would encourage women, if they're even thinking about it, at least go get a consultation, just so you know the information, you know, what are the options? You can think about it, let it percolate, you know, do I need an implant or not? Um, but don't wait too long because uh, life is going by. And when, once those, um, surgeries are done, it really opens up an entire new uh, world of uh, clothes you can wear and feel good in bathing suits. You know, it just can be really, really uplifting. And especially after, you know, getting through all the kids stuff, it's pretty wearing and exhausting. I think that most women owe it to themselves too, 
to, you know, put themselves number number one for a little bit and, and take care of themselves. So I would encourage them to just go for it. Yeah. I think um, it like can just add so much to your own self-confidence again. Absolutely. You know, even if, re- even if you wear a baggy sweater the rest of your, you know, you <laughs> still feel, you, you know, you know, what's under the baggy sweater. So you feel better about yourself and that that's yeah. what's most important. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Breister. It was fun to talk to you about this. And I know this summer we've got um, coming up, we're going to be talking with you on one of our live events. Oh, great. Where we're going to talk about mommy makers, makeovers. So we'll talk Excellent. about breast lifts, but we'll also go into other things like yeah. feminine rejuvenation Ooh. down there Exciting. and some tummy tucks. So we'll, we're, we're, we're going to look forward to having you back for that. Can't and, wait. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks All for right. joining us today. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having me. All right. And if you're listening today and you have questions and need information about scheduling or financing or, you know, want to see before and after pictures, we'll have in our show notes, we'll have links to before and afters and all the good things about, you know, how how to pay for it. And um, our patient coordinators are great with helping with financing, which really can help you get what you want now and be, and pay for it as you as uh, you're healing and enjoying your result. So that that's something that we you know don't be too shy to ask about because one in three of our patients and this has been for years one in three uses some financing. So um, we'll put all that in the show notes and then you can also find links to before and after photos of Dr. Breister and all our wonderful surgeons. And thanks again for joining us today. All right. Have a great day. Take a screenshot of this podcast episode with your phone and show it at your consultation or appointment or mention the promo code podcast to receive $25 off any service or product of $50 or more at La Jolla Cosmetic. La Jolla Cosmetic is located just off the I-5 San Diego freeway in the Zymed building on the Scripps Memorial Hospital campus. To learn more, go to ljcsc.com or follow the team on Instagram at ljcsc. The La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.